So you divided your uh, book and the artworks in seven different uh, chapters and through different themes. Uh, I picked up some of uh, them and I'd like to start talking about the first one that you entitled Figure and uh, Figuration. Uh, what is the difference between figure and figuration? Oh, actually, <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew you were going to pick me up on that, actually. <laughs> I, th I think it just figuration is just broader. I think the figure is just like the human figure, but figuration is uh, is is just a just a broader term. I think for it could be, you know, the figure in any form. It could also yeah. be, you know, animal figure as as well. I mean, I have to say that you know this was the the division into these sections was the the hardest thing really, yeah. um, because yeah. you know yeah. when you I mean, it's like general books and general exhibitions. That's also what I faced with the exhibitions are so hard in terms of how do you make a coherent structure? Um, and so when Natasha and I were working on this, it was like, I mean, we literally had in my, in my office, like this big wall um, and we had pictures of all these works and we tried to make kind of logical groupings and and you know it took a long time because because works you know could could go into one work into one place or or another but mm -hmm. in the end we we kind of settled on on these seven on these seven sections and um the fi the figure the, 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 i think it's so interesting people a lot of people when they first started i'm talking about people in the west when they first started looking at works by by Arab uh, artists um, and they saw the figure and they saw in them, oh, there's a little bit of Matisse here or, you know, something like that. So, so you know, people were quite critical of these works and it was like, oh, this is pastiche, this is not interesting. Whereas in fact, it is incredibly interesting, I think that, and everyone recognizes it now because you can't, in my view, you can't really understand the contemporary unless you understand these earlier. Right. Um, periods um of which actually only the the, the habud is is the is the early one here but of course um but uh but i th i think that that what is completely fascinating to me about this habud here lebuna yeah. is that it's the so habud made this in 1953 and as you know of course you know he's lebanese studied at alba went to paris um studied there was backwards and forwards a little bit like the marijuana thing it's like he's part he's regarded as being part of the école de paris yeah. but he's also lebanese you know and then that question of does it matter so what i think is fascinating about lebuna is that he so he made a whole series of artist books uh, Habud, and he's the first middle eastern artist to make artist books and artist books are very much the livre de peintre um is very much the french tradition you know all these artists Braque and picasso and miro you know they were all making making books but what to me is fascinating about this one is that he's making it in a, in um, the studio of a printmaker in paris in 1953 he's using etching techniques so you know very kind of french techniques here but the story is about Lebanon so the story of Lebuna is is one that he he heard that his grandmother used to tell him and all the other children um, to kind of frighten them and it was a story that was you know that was from this village um, and uh, she used to terrify them I mean it is a completely horrible story this I mean I'm not su yeah. surprised the children were were so were so frightened but right. but um, but you know that this 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 way of um of of uh, for me it kind of um why i just fell in love with this book apart from the fact i love artist books anyway i'm obsessed by them but but uh but for me it kind of encapsulated Abud, this book because of these two things in in it the lebanese story the french te technique there and then of course you've got asador oh sorry I... <laughs> No, 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 that's okay. So, yeah, anyway. So, yeah, uh, so here we have uh, works from uh, Marwan Khasabashi that we yeah. previously uh, talked about. So again, he's, uh, uh, he's an, uh, an artist who worked especially on faces, human faces. 
Absolutely. I think Marwan is so extraordinary. And I had the great privilege of meeting him um, once. And um, it was in Berlin. And it was just such a, a joy, the, just meeting him as a person. He was so extraordinary. Um, and this whole thing with, with Marwan that he, he trained in the studio of this well-known teacher, Han Trier, and he's a contemporary of Georg Baselitz. Um, and, uh, and that he did portraits, but then he sort of gradually he got so into the face or head as, it's, as, it, as it can be described. And it's, we're so lucky that we've got uh, actually these examples in the collection. So the one, the one you have on the left face landscape yeah. is from um, 19, 1973. And it's an amazing work and etching. And you know, it's called face landscape. It's regarded as the kind of the landscape of Syria. You look deep into it and you can see the lines and the rivers and the mountains in it. And then, then what I love is, is the way, you know, so many decades later, the little abstract one but it's still a face of course rec recognizably yeah. um but then uh also the um the the etchings are this set is incredibly interesting from from 1969 and and um my understanding is that 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 some of these the figures in it where he he saw these kind of newspapers of he felt very deeply about the palestinian cause and and uh, and so he was seeing pictures of these you know young men and you know, I don't know if they were throwing stones or, or whatever. And so a, a, um, a number of the, et the etchings in this, in this, um, the uncovered uh, it is based on, on, on these. They're a very, very powerful group. And, you, and I think the three together, uh, I think they're, they're very interesting. Mm. In your book, uh, you mentioned the Iraqi artist Hafez al Drubi who described how his parents uh, would warn him uh, against uh, sketching human figures when he was a child uh, because they were afraid that a spirit might come and breathe uh, life into his uh, drawings. So it is true that we have this um, idea that Islam bans uh, the figurative uh, representation. Uh, this uh, notion should be here nuanced. Right. Yeah, I think it, I think it can be nuanced because because uh, of course um, in religious context you you never find um, the, the the figure. You know, it's it's this notion that the the person who makes the figures, the musawwir, is uh, is usurping the creative function of, yeah. of God. But yeah. but uh, of course it was very nuanced and in uh, in. Um, in secular settings, you know, you think of the wall paintings of Samara, or you know, all the all these beautiful places, you know, these bathhouses from the early Islamic period, you know, with uh, with paintings. In so, in secular context, it was fine, but it still lingered on this 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 idea. Um, and in some places, it's you know, we know that it's actually quite a hot topical, well, a hot you know, political issue. I sh I, sh I should say, you know, destruction. We have the, had the destruction. Of of important sculptures, you know, in Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, this this kind of thing. So it's still it's still there. But what's interesting about Hafiz al Drubi is that he, in in his in his view, uh, you know, painting the figure was part of being modern. Um, and uh, and so of course, like many artists, you know, he would he would uh, he he went to study in in Rome where he learnt, you know, figure drawing alongside perspective, landscape, you know, all these other things that they, that they, that they did. And when he came back to Baghdad, he had a studio where he taught life drawing, you know, so that was quite an unusual thing. And also with this drawing, that it's, um, you know, it's the two, two nude women, it's a preparatory drawing for a, um, a large oil painting, you know, it's a, it's a bit of a risque thing to, to do. But but we were really lucky uh, at the museum to be because we don't collect oil paintings and he's you know he has amazing oil paintings. Yeah. Uh, we were able to get quite a lot of drawings which directly from the family. So the family who lives in lives in London, um, we were able to acquire some amazing drawings. Uh, which you've got two on the on the screen here, the, the the one on the left, but also this beautiful one of um 
the drunken friend in the in the Alwia Club garden there, and uh, he he drew most most beautiful most beautifully. So was it easy for uh, artists like uh, Hafez Drubi to produce that kind of uh, um, figurative uh, scenes? I would say. Yes, I, I don't think there were any 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 issues, you know. In, in Iraq, they were, yeah, I mean, in Iraq, you know, I mean, incredibly progressive in terms of in terms of art. Um, you know, we it's hard to think now with all the tragedy that Iraq has has suffered all these last decades. But but you know, they, it was amazing there. The Museum of Modern Art, these art galleries, you know, the movements we've talked about before, like real philosophy about 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 art um and i think you know artists were showing all all sorts of things i don't i i don't i don't think that there was that you know that i mean all of this was was it was accepted as i understand it yeah and even some uh, artists uh, produced uh, nudes and here we have an example from uh, shafi abud from uh, 1969 Exactly. This is a lovely, lovely work. Um, I was so happy that we were able to to acquire it. Um, and and the thing is that that you know Aboud, we've talked about him in terms of the the artist book, but uh, but that uh, but that he he's mostly known as as an abstract painter. But but um, he was painting nudes on and off all his life, as his daughter uh, told me. And, and but what's, what I think is lovely about this one is that there is an abstract quality to it as, as well. You know, she talks about how, you know, the features aren't exactly defined. And so I, I love this work. Um, so when we think about the arts of the Islamic uh, Arab Islamic world, we think of abstraction and calligraphy, as we said, and it's actually an important part of uh, the artistic identity and I guess aesthetics of uh, this region. And this is uh, the second chapter of your book, Abstraction, Geometry and Script. And here we have uh, an example from the Iranian uh, female artist, Munir Shahrudi Farman Farmayon. Yes, this is a this is a lovely work. I think it's it's interesting that there is a lot of abstract art um, that we have in the collection, but also ge generally produced by by artists from across this the breadth of this this region. And it it's not that um, they were doing abstract art because they couldn't do figuration. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not. It's um, in my view, it's not. It's yeah. not that at all. Although there is a long history of creating abstract art in Islamic culture. But I think what's interesting about this this work is is that you know Munir uh, is a very famous I Iranian artist. She she studied in America. She was best friends with Andy Warhol and Frank Stella. She returned to Iran and she had what she describes as an epiphany. She was standing in Shiraz in this mosque, the Shah Jarrah mosque, which had this incredible mirror ceiling. In fact, she looked up and she yeah. said to like, oh my God, what is this? Okay, so, and that sent her on a very particular direction. And she started, first of all, uh, working with the designs of this Kaja um, mirror work. But very, very soon, she developed her own language of abstraction. And you can see it particularly in, in her sculptures, but also in these in the wonderful drawings like, like this. Which and what the you know the really important thing about the drawings, why I love drawings so much, is that you can feel the artist's own hand there. Absolutely. And can you explain to us uh, the importance of the script uh, in the Islamic uh, culture? Script. Um, well, uh, yes, of course. Um, <laughs> and how? Uh, modern, and uh, my second, uh, my second question is how modern uh, contemporary uh, artists adapted the, the script uh, into their artworks. Well, the, the, the Arabic. The, the Arabic script is, is, of course, very important in Islamic culture because it was in Arabic, the language of Arabic, that the that Muslims believe the Quran was revealed in. It was in the Arabic script that it was written down. So there's huge status attached to the calligrapher. Um, so that's, you know, going back in time, of course. Um, but uh, the use of script con continued uh, into the into the modern era, 
and uh, and you find artists who you know there's like movements as there is it yeah. a movement or is it individuals horophia sometimes it's called you know artists like Etel Hadna and many others you know who you who use the script but what's interesting about this beautiful work of uh, Nabil Nahas, uh, one of his very, very beautiful, precious drawings from from the 1970s. So privileged he 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 gave us this this one and a few others, is that you know you get little hints of script, but it could right. be equally be be something else. Um, but but he, he talks about it as having a little hint of uh, of script and and that's nice. It's an echo. So we talked about Shekhar Hassan Said and uh, his uh, work uh, in the group of uh, that from modern art. And here we have. Uh, so it's a notebook, right? Well, so he calls it a daftar. So, so we've got two things here. He, uh, Shakir Hassan Asaid went into abstraction in a kind of very big way, and he and he started as a figurative artist, and he also was very influenced by by Sufism, and he developed this kind of abstraction uh, in you know in very interesting directions here, and um, what he calls this a daftar, and and there is a whole genre of Iraqi book art that are called Dafatar. I've mentioned Nadesh mm -hmm. Abut before, but this is something she has written a lot about there. It's become a particular genre that Iraqi artists, particularly from the 90s onwards, they couldn't because of sanctions, they couldn't get materials and so on. And so, uh, so it was Dia Azawi actually who encouraged them to start to make books. Um, and here we've got, um, uh, and a beautiful exa example of of them, and the one um, the one that we just saw of Shakir. There's no text in it. Yeah. Um, just just that just the colophon where and it says this is a daftar, yeah. um, and then but so these books take on incredibly wonderful forms here so sometimes they have text so so this is a beautiful one of Di diazawi uh it's very small in the way it unfolds there and it's a poem um by adonis so very often poets and artists particularly these iraqis uh and others um they they sort of work together that they they fed off e each other and so that the text really flows with the with the with the with the painting, yeah. Um, we've been talking about the Islam a lot, but I guess it's also important to recall that this part of uh, of the world also includes uh, other important religious communities like the Christian one. Um, in your book, you quote uh, the London-based artist Id Idris Khan, who said about his work, I quote. I like being an outsider looking into something that is part of me, no matter where I turn. Uh, here he's uh, alluding to his uh, experience as a Muslim who grew up in the UK. So uh, this is another uh, chapter of your book called uh, Faith. Uh, how, do you, how do the artists uh, reconnect to their uh, religions, religious identity? Well, it's a really interesting question. I I think that um, I think that uh, that uh, Idris Khan is a bit, is 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 very fascinating actually because it was his his father is a, is a Muslim and went on went on Hajj um, and uh, and so he he has kind of re reconnected in in a in a way or he he he's found inspiration particularly from his from his father's Hajj. Uh, actually, and and um, and uh, so he, you know, the, the 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 key thing is whether you call somebody a Muslim artist or mm -hmm. or not, um, and whether some people will talk about this material as being contemporary Islamic art, something yeah. you know, we've kind of touched on, but with, which I, I I'm not in agreement with. And when you think of Idris Khan, he's like an internationally re renowned artist. He's a very important British artist. Um, but he wouldn't call himself a Muslim artist in the way that so many artists that we've talked about um, are looking at at different sources. You know that their inspiration comes from different sources. One of his sources is music, 
you know, the, the other is his father's faith and going on Hajj and using text in really in interesting ways. So, so, uh, so I think that's, that's a really, that's quite an interesting thing, actually. You can't pigeonhole people. Yeah. Uh, so here we have two portraits uh, by the artist Adel Qureshi. Can you just remind us where this artist is from? Oh, this is so, these are so amazing, these works. So he's a Saudi, he's a photographer. And these two works were, are, are really extraordinary. They were a commission by, by uh, Prince Faisal, governor of uh, Medina, of this group of people who are called the Agawat. So this is part of a long tradition that goes into the medieval period. Ibn Jubair talks about the Agawat and they, they were um, the guardians of the mosque of the prophet. It was very traditional, they were eunuchs um, and uh, they would come from East Africa. And, uh, you know, for hundreds of years, this was a, this was a tradition. And so, um, so Adil Qureshi uh, then uh, was given this commission to photograph what is the last generation of these of these Agawat, and sadly some of them have passed away even since yeah. they were photographed. And and one of the things that struck him so much was was actually uh, the dignity of them and the way they wear the costumes and what and when you learn about the role that they had in the Nibir Jabari talks about this, you know, they were like washing the floors with with rose water and they were the guardians of the keys, you know, yeah. to the to the sanctuary. I mean they and now of course, you know, in recent times their roles were more ceremonial, but but uh, there's something very, very special about these people. So the great Sudanese artist Ibrahim al Salahi and we talked about this, uh, this work uh, a bit before in this uh, conversation. Uh, this work is uh, entitled, By His Will, We Teach Birds How to Fly. Um, and Salahi was a Sufi, was, was, was he a Sufi he is a, he is a Sufi, his father was a Sufi yeah. as, as well. And one of the lovely things about that, this is one of a, of a group of works that he, he uh, he made this ink and wash on paper in 1969, and uh, one of the things he talks about is how when his father used to pray, he would put his hand out, he would stretch out his arm, and his he would make the his hand into the shape of a bird, and that's what Ibrahim re recalls Recall, of how yeah. his father used to, yeah. And then, of course, the, the bird is a symbol of freedom, and he himself, you know, spent a, quite a period in, in jail in, in Sudan. And so he, 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 that's why he's brought these, these ideas together. But, uh, but he, yes, he's a, he is a Sufi, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then we have the contemporary so, uh, Saudi artist, Ahmed Madar al Ziyad. And here it's interesting how he combines so this uh, X-ray picture with what is some uh, what is this uh, page? His, uh, well, well, it's, it's really interesting this because he um, he was very influenced by by uh, the illumination that you find on on Qurans, uh, for example, and. And he um, wanted to, uh, he, he'd been doing these very interesting works which are to do with x-rays. We have a painting, one of the few paintings in the collection, but, um, but of, with, with an x-ray there. And so what he's, he's also done is, is he's put around the border, the illumination there, uh, he's, you've got uh, like repeated letters or repeated numbers. You know, this is something you find also in the magical tradition uh, as, as, as well. So repetitions of words, you know, it's all brings you luck. It's all kind of baraka. So this is a very interesting juxtaposition where, where you have, where you have this, this, you know, the skeleton as it were, and then the x-ray and then, and then you have this illumination uh, around the, the outside. Um, in the chapter uh, number six of uh, the book that you entitled Political Struggle, a, Relation, a Revolution and War, you quote the Palestinian artist uh, Hazem Harb 
who said, I quote, I have a mission in my life with my artwork. Being an artist is not just a job. So everywhere in the world, uh, artists have witnessed wars, experienced uh, injustice, and some of them are even politically committed, right? In, uh, in the Arab world, the works of Palestinian artists uh, highly refer to uh, the conflict that is unfortunately still uh, ongoing uh, nowadays with the celebration of their homeland and a sort of a nostalgia in their paintings. Here we have two examples from uh, Walid Abu Sha'ra and Sliman Mansour. Yes, I, yeah, this, this is ter terribly important, I, I think. Um, thank you for, for, the, for, the, for the question. Um, this idea of, you know, it's not just a job, is, uh, is, is you do find, certainly in the works that I've looked at by artists from across the, the, the region, this, this, this very clear way in which history and politics comes to the fore. Now, they, when you talk to artists about this subject, as I have done with, 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 with a few of them, you know, they'll say, we're not journalists. We're not, we're not trying to interpret. We're seeing things from our perspective. Yeah. And then we're making work from our, our perspective. Um, but, but because of that, I think, because it is a personal perspective, it, I think it makes it all the more powerful. So um, what you're seeing uh, with, um, with this beautiful work of Sliman Mansour, if we go with, with, the, with this one first, is that he is, what he is evoking is the checkpoint, you know, it's the Kalandia check, checkpoint. And, and it's that, it, it's what, what does it do to you if you are standing in these lines, you know, absolutely hours on end, you know, this kind of annihilating experience that, 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 that people have to go through you know all all the time and so he's giving that giving that perspective i think very very powerfully um and then the fascinating thing about the about walid abu shakra in these absolutely exquisite drawings uh is that is that of course he was living in london a lot of the time but he was going back and 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 forwards and and so you think you're you're just looking at a, a tree in a landscape, but every single one of these is named. Um, and it's about a particular place. And also you often find the cactus and the cactus, you know, the, the kind of story about the cactus, of course, sorry, <clears throat> first of all, it re relates to its suburb, it's like patience, um, but but also that they do not get destroyed. So, so they are often, it's often the, the cactus that mark the presence of these old Palestinian villages that are no longer there. So um, that's what I find so so powerful about about these works. And then with with these ones, you know, you're telling the story in in such a different way. So um, Amar Shomali's very very clever work here, which is the the, the post visit Palestine poster, very famous. Uh, poster that that you know was was made you know decades uh, ago when it was a kind of idyllic place come you know this whole Zionist dream come to come to Palestine and then what has he done he's put he's put the wall there so it's it's kind of playful but it's very hard hitting too and then you know you think of Mustafa Halaj a uh, great great art artist and he's using the imagery the iconography of the ancient past you know so the Canaanites you know these great kind of struggles so that's what you're seeing the epic str struggles mm -hmm. but something very very ancient about about these but it's telling this contemporary story and of course his story is is really terrible that you know he left of course he you know uh, was in Damascus and then his studio burnt down a lot of his work was uh, was lost but He's a very, very important artist. And then we have this work from the Lebanese uh, artist Ayman Balbeki called uh, Rue de, de Damas. So again, Ayman Balbeki is one of these uh, artists uh, who illustrate his, uh, who illustrates 
his time and his environment, political, social environment. Yes, I, I've been really fascinated by the way that so many Lebanese artists, brilliant Lebanese artists, um, uh, actually they find ways to talk about the history of Lebanon, but very particularly about the Lebanese civil war. You know, people will say um, to me, well, it hasn't, hasn't actually really ended. Um, and of course, we've seen all these terrible events and, and it was only just last week, the commemoration of this terrible blast um, that was so shocking and and that you're all living through so that's so tragic all, all of that but this 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 concern to talk about the civil war is is so interesting even though um people sometimes were were, were very small when 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 this when this yeah. was was going on but it has completely sort of entered the the, the, the psyche and and this this way of so what we have here of course is the Burj Al Moor isn't it so so this this idea of this incredible building that was as I understand it was 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 finished just before the beginning of the civil war in seventy five and it was it was it was a sniper post um, and and now it's so big that it can't you know it's it's too you can't rebuild it as I understand it but you can't also pull it down because it would be too too dangerous so it's kind of stuck it's like this this building that is almost like a symbol of the of the Lebanese civil war. Well, you, you probably drive past it every every yeah. day. Um, and it's I'm always so, where every time I come to Beirut, when I see it, I'm always so shocked as as well that it's it's there. It's almost there as a kind of judgment in a way, don't you think? There's something so powerful about it. And this is, of course, he's he's made this scene, um, Ayman, in in the beautiful large oil paintings that we don't have because we only have paper so so but he's managed to kind of miniaturize it um really on in this in this work here thank you so much Benicia, for introducing introducing us to all of these beautiful works uh, congratulations for your book congratulations for the exhibition uh, i have one more question um how do you see the future of uh, Middle Eastern art integrating the collections of museums or institutions, let's say in Europe or in the United States or uh, somewhere else. Well, that's a very that's a very important question. Um, I think the key word here is integration. I think I think uh, for the future, we shouldn't be. We're at the stage now where it's where it's necessary, at least for my institution, to have a section with this Middle Eastern art, but that shouldn't carry on too long. Yeah. Um, works like this should be, these are international artists, they should be integrated completely um, into, 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 into different contexts. And, you know, for example, at Tate uh, in London, you know, they are collecting also the work of Middle Eastern artists and they place them in the context of modernism and, yeah. and, and, and so on. And so I think in, in the future, this is really, really important that we get away from these are just, let's just pigeonhole them, you know, as, as, uh, as I've done. So I'm like talking against myself here, if you like. Um, you, yeah. but, but, but for the future, I, th I think this is the key thing is because that not only is the art extraordinary and, and beautiful and powerful, but it tells such interesting stories. And, you know, my, my, my big thing really is, is that because we're collecting in the framework of the British Museum, we're a museum of history, yeah. these works are telling stories um, and we need to listen to them. We need to listen to the perspectives of these, of these artists. Thank you so much Lisa, for your participation in this panel. Well, it's so kind of you to invite me and, and I can't wait to come back to Beirut. Hopefully, um, yeah. Inshallah, I hope Inshallah. so very yeah. much. Thank, Thank you so, so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.